So now we're finally on to tried step number three, paying bills, which I have to say, most advocates' first reaction when someone walks into our own utility bills, they get on the phone and try to find money. We're doing it last, okay? We're saving that money. Um, the single largest source of assistance for paying people's utility bills is the fuel assistance program. And this year it has um, over $200 million available to help people pay their bills. Um, something I don't mention, but I just remembered, it, it is worth knowing that fuel assistance primarily pays your heating bill. So if you, you heat with oil, most of your benefits are going to go to the oil bill. But if you didn't need all of the benefits for your oil bill, up to half of your benefit could be used for the electric bill or a gas bill. Let's say if you use gas for cooking. Maybe they can't do gas cooking. They can certainly do electricity. Um, particularly if it's going to stop a termination or restore terminated service. But if you heat with oil, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to pay your oil bill. Um, last year, because the benefit levels were high as they are this year, a lot of payments were made on electric bills because the fuel assistance was adequate to take care of the heating problem and there was money left over for the electric bills. Um, in the Boston area, um, you apply to ABCD for fuel assistance. They also have several outlying offices, as you probably know, in the neighborhoods. Um, if you were working in any other part of the state, um, DHCD, the state agency that runs fuel assistance, has a wonderful brochure called Cold Relief. So if you were to Google Cold Relief and DHCD or Cold Relief and Fuel Assistance in Massachusetts, you get this nice chart that says whatever city or town you is, it lists every city and town. There's a little number, and then there's a table. The numbers match the various agencies around the state as to where you can apply uh, for fuel assistance. I will say exceedingly li little about RAF, the Residential Assistance for Families in Transition program, because as far as I know, it's out of money everywhere in the state. It is a much uh, finer sieve, if you will. It's hard to get through that sieve and get assistance when you can. I don't know the rules that well for the past year. It used to be as much as $1,500 could be paid on utility bills, but it's once in a lifetime. It's only for families. So it's pretty tight rules, and the money's gone this year. But it's worth keep, every year it's worth keeping an eye on the RAF program because when the money does become available, if it's in the budget again, when it's available for the people who can get it, it actually can be a lot of money. Um, WAP and HeartWAP, which is the Weatherization Assistance Program and a related um, heating system tune-up and repair program. When you apply for fuel assistance, that very same application qualifies you for both weatherization and heating system work. And I want to stress that when a house is weatherized, um, that can reduce the bills 30% when they blow insulation into the walls. If you have a really old furnace and they replace it with a new one, that can reduce your bills by more than 30%. This is hugely important to people. If you have a furnace that needs tuning up and cleaning out and it's running awfully, awfully they can <laughs> fix that too. Um, I, I want to go back to the fuel assistance program for a moment. It is important to know that even if your heat's included in the rent, so you're not paying separately for the heat, you are eligible for fuel assistance. So no one should be exclu self-excluded from fuel assistance. There are some people, not all, some people who live in subsidized housing and don't pay for their heat directly, are ineligible for the fuel assistance program. Even there, don't self-exclude because the rules are so complicated. Let fuel assistance figure it out. Drive the person in to apply because even if they're not eligible for the fuel assistance payments, they will get low income discount rate if they're income eligible. They would be eligible for the AMP program. They're eligible um, for all of the protections. Um, so applying for fuel assistance is always, always, always a good thing if you think your clients are income eligible. On the weatherization assistance program, uh, renters can also get weatherization assistance so long as the landlord agrees that the work can be done on the house. So you got a triple decker. I'm sure you got a lot of triple deckers around the neighborhood. If there are low-income people in the building, the whole building can be weatherized. Obviously, it's the landlord's building. You can't work on it without his permission. But tenants shouldn't exclude themselves from the weatherization program. Um, the rules for heating systems are a little tighter. It's a little harder to get um, heating systems worked on if you're a renter responsible for the heat. But those programs are, were expanding how many renters we reach. 
So uh, I guess the basic message is renters should not exclude themselves from any of these programs. Even renters who aren't paying for their own heat shouldn't exclude themselves from fuel assistance. Um, I've listed utility programs, but basically the utility programs add more dollars to the programs I've just described. So we can reach more people and give them more help. Citizens Energy, you know, what we often see as Joe for Oil, it's, I think it's shut down for the year. I saw a bunch of the emails on my listserv, so that's not available at the moment. But most years, at least at the beginning of the heating season, people who have gone through their fuel assistance or are slightly over the income eligibility limit for fuel assistance can get very cheap oil from the Joe for Oil Citizens Energy program. They have a pretty good website to describe that program. Local resources. Okay, oh this happens every now and again. So what was your name? Akila. Akila pointed out, you know, we, we get this information from the United Way, the pink sheet, Advocate's Guide to the Special Fund. This information is specific to Boston. I use it in other parts of the state just as a sample of the kind of, you know, information that can be gathered about miscellaneous sources. We haven't updated this in a while, so as Akila pointed out, the information about traveler's aid um, is no longer accurate. The people aren't there. The address has changed. Um, but it's just a kind of reminder that there are a lot of places you can go, because I often get these emails on our listserv. Okay, we used a fuel assistance. The person needs a little more. Where do we go? Or the person slightly above fuel assistance eligibility. Where do we go? So United Way did this. Like my blue sheet on retroactive application of the discount, this is not for distribution to your clients. This is advocates can call up these places and, and try to access money. Um, so I'll, I'll give you some, a general rule that I have found very useful. You want to find out every state and local agency that's helping your client, because they may be helping them with some other issue, social services of some kind, or helping the kids. Sometimes those places have little pots of money, always worth knocking on that door. Um, any religious organizations in that community, you might want to knock on those doors. Um, because you never know where you're going to find money. Um, I know most of you work in Boston, so I'll tell you the Boston-specific one. But generally, cities and towns have emergency funds. Um, particularly in Massachusetts, it's been settled by Europeans for a long time. A lot of them died and were rich and gave money to their local city and town for general charitable purposes. In Boston, there are so many of those charitable bequests that there's actually, I think it's called the Office of Charitable Bequests or something like that. I did the training once at City Hall. It literally is a door that you can knock on. Um, so uh, people in the field are much better at this than I am, so this is just a sample. I didn't develop the sheet. I'm not that good at locally everywhere in the state where to look for money. Um, but this is particularly an example where you want to spend money last. So if you have a, I, I recently had a call from someone who owed, um, oh, it was this 62-year-old lady who was so upset about, you know, she applied for fuel assistance, she was paying 50 a month, but she was at that point $3,000 behind and she was driving herself crazy, not, she herself, not an advocate, was going to the local church and I'm thinking, you know, so what, you'll find another $300, you'll be $2,700 behind. Let that organization save its money for someone who's not that far behind, and the $300 makes a huge difference. So I, I urge you to use good judgment because most of these types of sources are very small scale in total dollars. You want to get that $300 for someone who's like $600 behind, and you're mostly going to dig them out of the hole. Okay. Um, what else about payment sources? Uh, that's about it. So let me say a few words about um, resolving disputes. Um, OK, I glanced on this earlier. Always call the, uh, the company first. Why do I say that? People remember what I said? You call the DPU. The recorded message says if you're calling about a utility problem and you haven't called your company, call the company first. You're not going to make a lot of progress. Um, Second, I would urge you to do your homework. Um, so I'll give you examples. I sometimes get intakes, and the person on the phone doesn't know if it's the electric bill or the gas bill, doesn't know which company it is. I, I don't say this critically, because most of these people calling are not utility advocates. But really, try to figure out which company, how large the bill is, a little bit about the payment history. Before you call up anybody, get a sense, is there somebody seriously ill? Is there an infant in the house? I'll think, is it the winter moratorium? Um, and to the extent you can, try to get a handle on that budget situation. What are the income 
what's the income and what are the expenses? Is this the clients who are so desperately poor um, <coughs> that payment plans aren't going to work at all? Or is this someone I can work out a payment plan? Is this someone that the arrearage management program would be a good match for to get them out of that bad arrearage without having to pay for it? Um, are they on the discount rates? Have they gone to fuel assistance? Um, it's kind of why we put together the uh, orange sheet and the yellow sheet, the checklist. You, you want to go through all of those things on the orange and yellow sheet pretty much in every case. 